why don't you each of you introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about what you do and, and what you have seen in Miami in the last few years. Yeah, and speak up to the microphone, please. Yes, why don't you start, please? So, um, thank you for having me here. Um, Jesse Ali, President of Development Sales for Severa Real Estate. Um, we've been with Severa for about 17 years and we've sort of had the pleasure of watching this incredible city really grow into a city. I was driving across the bridge, I guess, just a, a couple of weeks ago from downtown to, to Brickell and I was just taken by how the city has really come of age in such a short period of time. You know, I'm traditionally from, uh, from Australia. I uh, lived in California for many years, lived in Venezuela for many years, uh, doing real estate in all of those markets. And it's just been such an incredible time when I got here in 2000, when I know a lot of us got here actually, it's kind of an interesting dynamic. A lot of people got into Miami at that period of time. And we've been very much blessed and privileged to see this incredible growth in our city. So that's very real estate we've been uh, delighted to work with a lot of developers who have really made that change. So this panel is exciting to me because it's talking about the future, it's talking about trends, it's talking about what's coming. And as a new city, we're so well positioned to be able to look at other trends in other parts of the world and other markets and to adopt those into our new product moving forward. So it's uh, it's very exciting time. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you all also for inviting me. Thank you, Jessia and Kovia, my friend. My name is Santiago Vanegas. I'm a president of uh, Habitat Development, part of Habitat Group. I'm a, a real estate develop, developer uh, with uh, 18 years experience here in Miami, specializing in the Moist Brickwood area and in Little Havana. <coughs> and, um, we come from a little real estate asset management um, that they buy and, and operate income properties. And depend on the cycle, we develop as well uh, a project depend on the cycle. Um, in this moment, we have a, a, an amazing project with what we think is a match very, very nice for this uh, forum because uh, our project involve technology and the name of the project is uh, Smart Recall. Uh, so uh, I think it is very interesting to start discussing what is the moment of the cycle that we are right now. So we think that this project is perfect for the ne next cycle. In addition that involve all these trending technology elements that uh, everybody wants to have in today's life. Everybody, everybody wants a uh, smart a lifestyle involving some technology in, in the house, involving uh, smart design um, and smart use of the property that you could have, uh, especially in today's days where, where, where you have an Airbnb, new element in the industry, so and all the other uh, apps that involve real estate and smart living. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Kobe Carr. I'm an architect. We have a small office on 29th and Biscayne. We have been in Miami since 1988. We do mostly lifestyle, resorts, hotels, um, any kind of lifestyle. We do affordable housing, like the Lyric we just finished um, by uh, downtown. We do Fisher Island. We're doing the Palazzo del Sole and Luna. We're finishing the Four Seasons in Surfside, starting the Four Seasons in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we do a lot of hotels, hospitality, limited service, AC Mayor, Hampton Inn on 34th and uh, Biscayne. Um, the Hyatt in Miami Beach, you might have seen the AC in Miami Beach, you might have seen the Residence Inn on uh, 17th Street we've done. And we do work domestic and international, from Abu Dhabi to Cape Town to Cambodia and Vietnam, and of course Russia, can't forget about Russia, we work in Sochi and Moscow. Um, and we work domestically and international, um, and we do take Bitcoin, by the way. And um, we're basically are a Miami um, a local company that started in Miami in the late 80s. Back then, the business the cycle was a little bit different. It was Miami Vice and Scarface days and historic reservation was just starting in Miami Beach. 
since then, um, obviously it's gotten a little bit better uh, to a certain extent, and that's what we do on a daily basis. Thank you. Everyone here? Yep. Yeah. Um, Andrew Craig, I'm a uh, small real estate developer um, working on a couple of multifamily, small multifamily projects in Little Havana. I also do uh, consulting work and fee development. Uh, I'm also on the board of TriRev, so I get a lot of involved with a lot of mobility, public transportation, and TOD discussions here in South Florida. I'm also the vice chair of their Land Institute. We're also getting a lot of policy initiatives regarding mobility as well as uh, affordability and sea level rise. Um, and uh, to the point of technology and sort of the new, uh, the new um, I also am uh, an informal advisor for um, Urban Us, which is a venture capital firm based here in Miami that invests in what they call urban tech, uh, anything in technology <coughs> that's to improve the built environment, mobility, or the operations of local government. They have also entered into a partnership with BMW Mini to create an accelerator in New York, and I've also, I also serve as a, as a mentor uh, to one of those companies. Um, that's currently going through the accelerator. So <laughs> I try to stay on top of current trends in using technology in real estate and the built environment generally. Thank you. Now that we have a panel with a vast expertise of all the different things that are going on, Kobe, why don't you get us started with, with where do you think, you know, your signs are all over the BCD, where do you think we're going with the future development both in the residential and the, and the commercial side? So my signs used to be all over the city, but they were, they were taken down because of the hurricane, for lunch thing. No, but seriously, I think that we are in a unique time. Um, I'm 55 years old, and as I told you, I've been here for about a quarter of a century. Looking around this um, beautiful room, um, this is cyclical, but there is continuous business ongoing in the real estate market here in Florida. Um, Andrew just mentioned um, transportation and technology, and it's, it's a game changer. Once we get Florida more connected from a transportation standpoint, and not just um, the train, for example, we have never had direct flights to Abu Dhabi or to the Middle East or to the Far East. I would always have to go through Europe, wait for a couple of hours, change airplanes, and let somebody else, like British Airways or Lufthansa, make the money. Now we are starting to have direct flights, not only from Miami, but also from Fort Lauderdale. And I think those kind of actions are game changers. Um, they're very important because they allow the, the majority of the population to enjoy arguably what is one of the best countries in the world, but also one is what is one of the best states in the lower 48, the only subtropical weather um, climate that you can have in the United States, which is here in Florida. And I think it's important for people to be able to fly directly from the Far East and the Middle East. Um, you know, I can say in this beautiful room, how many people were not born in Miami? And you know, you will have everybody raising their hand. And that just right there tells you, I don't care what the economy is, I don't care if Castro's kicking off everybody out of Cuba, I don't care if the market is crashing in Russia, I don't care if there's a revolution in Venezuela, or if there's a war in the Middle East, Florida will continue to have positive population growth. It's public record. <coughs> the United States Census, you can look it up. In over a decade, you get a 10% growth, which is 1% on an annual basis. Based on that, you have continuous buildings, which, as you all know, in the 70s and 80s, were not built to meet the code, and we don't have uh, fresh, brand new buildings of any um, caliber. And I'm talking high end, middle end, uh, low end. Uh, middle class, affordable uh, or workforce, as we like to call it. <laughs> and so I'm optimistic. Uh, I don't care who the president is. I'm optimistic about the growth of South Florida. Thank you. Well, we'd like to add, what, what are people looking for? What are the people that are coming to live here, to invest here, looking for in the development that you guys are seeing, and what trend do you see that we are going to continue seeing in the future? Sure. Um, I, th I think
think to build on, on Cody's statement, I mean, I'm, I'm also optimistic. Um, and I think it, it, has, it has to do with um, the health of, the relative health of all the various sectors. I mean, currently right now, you clearly have another condo blood happening, but you look at apartments, office, retail, office industri you know, industrial, all the other sectors, I still think that there's um, you know, great demand uh, for it and slow su supply process. Um, so I think that other sectors will remain relatively healthy. And, and to that diversity of, of, uh, of sectors that are, that are functioning, there's also diversity of demand. People are looking for different products. They're looking to live in different neighborhoods. Um, some people want the suburbs, <coughs> some people want urban infill, some people want conventional office space, other people want co-working or we work. Some people want traditional rental housing, other people are looking for to live in, you know, uh, co-housing, co-living, a dorm for grown-ups, micro units, all these different things. So I think it's it's there's folks that are convinced in the health of you know national retail and, and large malls, you know. Uh, the city center and now you know whatever portion of the world center is still retail the continuing development of, of design district but i would also say that there's demand for more neighborhood retail stores that people can walk to bodegas dry cleaners um, bakers in the neighborhood so different scales of retail are also in play um, different hotel concepts different locations and grassroots are just in a uh, a loft hotel west of the airport, which is, I think, you know, I, I had not heard of uh, an, an, air, an airport related hotel happening in that area, but maybe that's just my East Day uh, bias. Um, so I think there's a lot of things happening in a lot of different sectors with a lot of different product uh, and a lot of different uh, market drivers or market interests for, for new ways of living. No, no, as you mentioned, and kind of with what Jesse said, that the staggering number of development in Miami are incredible. I was just looking some statistics to share with you. Last year, Miami International Airport moved 44.5 million people. That's more. That's probably 150,000 a day, and the population of Miami Day is 2.5 million. So, in one month, we moved more than the entire population of the county in, by MIA. The statistics of our port, our port also has grown tremendously. Last year, we moved 8.8 .8 million tons of cargo. We have 5.5 million cruise, cruise passengers. So by any means, right now we're building 447 towers in Miami-Dade alone. So with all that high-density land that is basically becoming more scarce, what do you think new projects and new futures are, are we're going to see moving forward? Why is that you don't tell us? What do you think will happen? Talking about uh, density of land, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the knowledge that we have is especially in uh, big downtown. Big downtown, we are talking about uh, Brickell area, downtown area, and Biscayne corridor. You know? All these three areas is what uh, Miami Development Authority call uh, the big Miami. You know? it's Public information in Miami Development Authority, and and the the, the land is, is going and the urbanist is going north. You see very very uh, limitation uh, for supply of land, for example, on Brico and as well on West Brico. Um, for example, uh, on West on Brico and West Brico, especially West Brico, we are talking about 18 acres. For development, 18 acres in um, talking about T624, which is uh, West Brico. You, we just have for West Brico 3,600 units for the next cycle. So it's very limited what we are talking about uh, land availability on on West Brico. The city, the Miami 21, is 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 making some bonuses for uh, housing. For example, they give you a double of density. Kobe could um, help me with that, even more specifically, technically. 
but uh, uh, they are saying that they give you 80 percent uh, bonuses if you go most most like um, like um, like a uh, housing or subsidy uh, unit. Uh, every cycle is is every cycle is around three thousand and uh, ten thousand unit going ten thousand on uh, Brickell area. 10,000 unit on uh, uh, downtown Miami and 10,000 unit in uh, Biscayne corridor. Um, right now, we are seeing the, the end of the cycle. Uh, for example, in Brickell area, uh, the, the supply uh, in this year is the most difficult year for this cycle, talking about supply. Uh, 1,700 uh, units are delivering. Uh, this year on um, Brico area, but the next year we just have Eco Brico. As you see on, on Brico area, there is no more crane. The cycle is ending in this moment. Uh, for 2019 is the last project uh, of the cycle on Brico, which is flat iron. So there is, there is not a supply for new project on Brico for 2020. So there is the, there is a, the developer are going and I start looking for land and uh, and especially for the next cycle of course. Okay. Thank you. And yes, you, you guys manage several development <coughs> very various developers in town. What are you seeing? And you're in complete touch with the end user, the investor or the owner that is gonna live on the unit or are gonna occupy the retail space. What are you seeing lately? Where do you think you know this this cycle is pretty much getting to, to the end? But what are you seeing on, on development phase? What are you seeing going forward? So we're in the absorption stage right now. Um, the untold story, but I think it's very important that we're seeing in the market. You know, and in this cycle we've represented over 20 different development projects, and we've been selling around a thousand units a year, and now we're closing around a thousand units a year. But the untold story and the good news is that they're all closing. Uh, the closings, knock on wood, have been exceptional on our project. Um, you know, there's very few markets in the world that demand a 50% deposit structure. And that's a new model that was adopted in this cycle here in Miami by the developers. Um, and it was a very smart model. It was basically sort of adapting the Latin American model into Miami. Um, and it created, and it has created, tremendous stability in the market. So there's a lot of conversation about inventory and, and all the rest of it. But yes, I think you addressed it earlier in the population growth year. And I'm going to go back to how I had in my opening statement that as a city, sort of we're growing so quickly that our product is just keeping up with us. So that it's a very natural cycle. I felt like four years ago, every month I was launching another project. And then a year later, every month I was going to groundbreaking another project, and then a year after we were having a top-off party. So now every month it seems like we're closing these buildings, and as Santi says, we are coming to the end of that cycle. Um, but it's a very strong base right now. So we're in the absorption stage, right? So what will happen now is these units come online, they'll be rented, they'll be resold, they'll be remarketed, what have you. It has also cleared the sort of landscape uh, for the buyer. So the buyers that are coming in now, there was a period a couple of years ago where it was like, you know, sideshow alley in the surface. That every time somebody put a deposit on, you, on, a, on a building, well, there's another one that popped up four blocks away. And so the buyers are trying to decide between which projects they should be buying. In. Now it's a cleaner landscape, I think, for buyers that are coming in. What they're looking for is value. What they're looking for is, you know, uh, Kirby touched on, on, on the transportation component. I think that's absolutely key. Uh, we have some of our developers, um, like the Mellow Group, that are doing Ari on the Bay. Their, one of their business models is to buy land next to the people movement downtown. So as the demographic changes, these, these buyers, whether they be foreign buyers, whether they be local buyers that have decided to have one car instead of two cars or no cars, are now a lot more connected. So we're seeing that sort of trend in, in the development world as well. Um, we're also seeing, I think, the biggest shift is, is sort of a need for <laughs> diversification of use. And in full disclosure, we are representing Santi and Smart Brickle, but, and we just met recently, 
But when I met Santi, I said, I've been waiting to meet you for like four years because I think you're one of the smartest developers in Miami because during the, the financial crisis a few years ago, what you did with Habitat and, and sort of pivoted and made a very successful project out of a typical condo building was, was brilliant. And it's that kind of flexibility of use that, that we're now incorporating into, into smart triple that a lot of our international buyers are looking for. So I think in the past, some of the developers have sort of built buildings that were sort of answers to a question that was never really asked. So they build it and then we'll sell it. But now I think the developers um, <coughs> and working with the architects, which you know we are very privileged in this city to have some brilliant star architects like Kobe, uh, that really are game changers. They're global names, they travel the world, they bring back these ideas, and they add to our city. I don't think we recognize enough the, the impact and the importance of architects because they really have a global footprint, and what they are doing for our city to, to bring back these ideas, I think, is, is absolutely exceptional. But our buyers are responding to that, so that's, that's probably our biggest shift for some. Thank you. One of the things that really staggers me is that our life has significantly changed in the last five years, and many of us have not even noticed it. We all used to own cars five years ago. Some people don't own a car right now. Some people used to go out on a day on a car. Now everyone Ubers out. When you travel, people used to go to a hotel. Now we all go to, to an Airbnb, and everything changes. You know, we, where we work, everyone used to have their own small office. Now, many of us work on a, on a shared environment, and that is having huge impact in the lifestyles of, of everyone. How do you think going forward, you know, it only happened the last five years, so, you know, we cannot even project what can happen in the future. So all these technologies that are really changing real estate, and Miami is a city that, you know, one of my, my clients said that Manhattan took 100 years to do it, Miami is going to be finished in 30 years. So how do you think all these technologies will start impact a city like Miami, which is growing at such a staggering pace? Anyone? So we're working in uh, Lima, Peru. Um, and Lima has a population of about 10 million, 11 million people in its Barranco, Mira Flores area. <laughs> and then in Miami, we have a lot less people. When you go to Mexico City, or Panama, or when you go to other, other countries in South and Central America, the population center is so much greater. What will happen now, what's happening now, is we're finally um, starting to build the urban core. So we built Sunny Isles Beach substantially, we built Aventura substantially, Miami Beach is substantially filled up, but the urban core and the periphery, whether it's the river, it is going to get filled up. Now there's a drastic change in the way people behave and think and communicate today that was not in existence five years ago or 10 years ago, right? So 10, seven years ago when we were building in Abu Dhabi, we used to have Blackberries. Well, today we, everybody has in their pocket the Samsung or the iPhone, and we can, we, can, we can fly to the moon with that, with the technology that we have. But the point of the matter here is for us as in the real estate business is that the car, when, I, when, I, when we were growing up, was, was something, a point of reference. We all wanted the car and what car we had. So, but, but today, when I look at my kids and the next generation, the clients are coming into the office, car is completely irrelevant. And if they can get rid of the car, if they can find somebody to drive on, Uber, Lyft, what have you, that's the way to go. Besides that, the public transportation is getting so much more easier to use and more sophisticated because of technology. <coughs> and when you, and it's not just Miami, it's every country around the world. We just finished a project in Cape Town. It's the same thing. People want to have a better quality of life. That is important to understand because the minute you desire and you have the, the wish to have a better quality of life, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I would rather be a bum with no money in Miami Beach under a coconut tree than be under a, a tree in 30 below. <laughs> and, that's, and that's one of the reasons why I came here. Having to understand that, then most people will make their own personal decisions and will end up in South Florida, which is, again, it's the only subtropical climate in the lower 48. The minute you acknowledge and understand that, then you will see that the next generation really desires to live here one way or another. Winwood. Winwood used to be, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, an industrial location. Now we're doing a project for East End and related called Winwood 25, which has that uniqueness that Jesse's talking about of the resi mix with, with the commercial. But I don't want to bore you with that. What I want to tell you is that the way we are looking at real estate is going to drastically change 
in, in the next five to 10 years. We as architects, for example, right now, are working on a project, major project, single family residential. <laughs> Everybody's familiar, when I grew up, a solar panel meant that you run a copper pipe to a glass box and it heats up the water. Today a solar panel means that it can soak up the energy and, and charge a battery. Well, a few years ago, we did not have the technology on the Blackberries to last more than a couple of hours, but today we have the technology on a battery that we can drive you around in a Tesla car. Imagine that battery connected to a motor, and that motor is sitting in your garage, and it's connected by low voltage wire to your solar panel on the roof. Then pretty soon, when you buy your house for $50,000 additional financeable into your house, you can have that package, that solar package with the battery, with the generator. Mm -hmm. And it's nice and quiet like a Tesla car. So pretty soon, it runs your air conditioning or your heating system, which is the most cost expensive that every family has. $1,000 a month on an average, $12,000 a year. You buy the package for $50,000, $60,000, pay back in four to five years, and then you're off the grid. Well, you can't really legally be off the grid like Bitcoin, but you will be 90, 95% off the grid, and that's where you save the money. So if you buy a house from any developer or the bankers who are sitting back there want to finance it at a low interest rate, then you have that opportunity to provide. And that's what we're doing. And right now, in Puerto Rico just happened and the infrastructure is falling apart, but that's what we're working on on a macro scale in Puerto Rico. Now that technology <coughs> was actually invented and started by a company called Mazdar, M-A-S-D-A-R, in Abu Dhabi, or oh, oh, you can Google it, at about 10 years ago in 05, 06, and 07. And they did not want to call it LEED, they called it Estidama, which in Arabic means the pearls, but that's what you find in the Gulf, in the Arabian and the Persian Gulf are the pearls. And that's, those kind of ratings come from everywhere around the world. And the technology, whether the panel is made in Germany, or the, or the engine is made in, in France, or the wiring are put together in China makes no difference. To, in the next five to 10 years, that's where we will be. And that's what we have to understand. And it's going to be interesting. I mean, I'm excited about it. Today, we're designing buildings. There have, we're doing it in Wynwood again, an office building with mixed use, but the glass can potentially act as the solar panel. And that is connected to a low voltage wire that runs inside the frame. That then connects you to the batteries that are sitting in the basement. And the basement is, is <coughs> flood protected, doesn't take you any of the hours of density. And then you have an ability to run the office building so your camp charges go substantially down, just because we have the technology. And of course, we're making it so that if in the future the solar panel becomes more efficient, we'll throw away that old solar panel. And if we want to, we will even change the engines. So, and that's, that's what gets interesting. Sorry about that. Oh, incredible, you know, because that's what's going to impact the lives of everyone sitting here, everyone, our kids, everyone invested in Miami. But I want to hear more from all of you guys. All of you guys have a different perspective, are playing with different gadgets, so let's hear from, I, all, from all of you. Yeah, I think, I, I'm, thank you, Alfonso. I think we are in, in this transition as we have always been, you know, always evolving, maybe like 20 years ago, happened the same, the same thing. We are always in this evolution uh, uh, in every aspect, in, in real estate, of course, as well. Now we have a lot of new technologies like apps, for example, uh, like the Nest for the air condition, like the Lyft for the lights, um, and Alexa, you know, the fixture that Amazon <coughs> sells that help you, and app that connect you to the concierge to ask for the Uber or Instacart, may they go to the supermarket. Uh, so uh, we have to give the buyers or the investor that sense, that that sense, or that um, that what that is what they want. So we as a, as a developer, the future development is going to be standard <coughs> in five years. That every de development is going to have next is going to have lead lead. Because all these kind of that today is like wow is gonna be standard in five years, but um, we have to incorporate an additional uh, apps or additional solution because, for example, a third party like Airbnb came to the industry and start to compete to the hospitality. But everyone, everybody wants to do Airbnb 
in the shorter red dot condom, then it's going to happen that the condom dogs is going to allow in the future the condom dogs for the building, residential building, they have to start uh, allow some of the short, short and red dots legally paying the tax uh, and etc. For example, <coughs> yesterday, real deal, it put the news that in Orlando is a building already with a trademark with Airbnb. So Airbnb is going already in joint venture with development with developers to uh, to to make to make money now. So uh, that's what we have to <coughs> deliver it to the, to the to the buyers in this moment. Any other futuristic, you know, wish that you want to tell us before we, we talk to another subject? Andrew, sure. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say I, I'll, yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged by the promise of of uh, car sharing and, and self-driving vehicles. Um, as a board member of TriRail, we sort of set up this tension between do we, invest, do we continue to invest in public transportation or are robots driving Uber is going to solve all of our problems? Um, and I think um, there's hopefully there's a both and <coughs> strategy because we have current residents and current technology and we've made current commitments and plans to the, the six corridors of Miami Dade County. And, uh, uh, you know, people need help getting to work, getting to stores, getting around the county in a more economical way now. So maybe in the future, uh, Uber and Lyft will solve all of our problems. Um, I think that we can't, that can't allow us to stop making improvements and making investments uh, in, in existing technologies to improve people's lives in the short term. So just acknowledging a little bit of tension there. Thank you. Well, one thing, you know, Miami, let's tie up to the panel that we had at the beginning today about affordability. Miami is one of the least affordable cities in the entire US. And now we couple that with the millennials. So the millennials are taking longer and longer. They're living with their parents longer. They're renting more. And they're going to take more time to own a property. How do you think that trend with the millennials, with the lack of affordability, how is this? And Miami, that you know, we are really not good at public transportation, because there is no really public transportation like New York or other cities. How are we going to fit together with someone that works in Brico, lives in Kendall, and now has to commute two hours, and when they grow up, they're not going to be able to buy something in Brico because they don't have the enough money to do the down payment. How do you think all this affordability and the millennial time are going to continue changing our landscape? So, uh, that's an interesting conversation, and it's out there in the market, obviously, the whole millennial conversation. Um, and there's kind of two parts to it, right? Um, you know, the question is, is the chicken or the egg? So a millennial's not buying homes because they're too expensive, expensive or a uh, millennial's not buying homes because they're renting for longer. And, you know, I was at one of our conventions in um, San Diego recently. They were talking about the impact of millennials on the home market in general. And the fact that that's the single largest uh, sort of spike in home buying is caused by one thing, getting married and having kids. That's what encourages and spikes home sales, getting married and having kids. So as millennials stay longer and longer with their parents, they rent for longer and longer, we're finding millennials as a demographic to be a lot more fiscally, fiscally sophisticated. So they're learning to budget earlier, they're saving their money sooner, they're planning out earlier, and so, in some cases, you know, we're representing the project um, University Bridge, which is the first student housing project yeah. as a condominium that's come to Miami. Um, and that's located directly uh, across the 8th Street from FIU. And as a student housing condominium, uh, we've got some millennials buying there before they buy their own home. So they see that the, sort of the financial opportunity of buying with a lease back and a program in place for student housing in South Florida before they'll go and buy their own condo. So that's kind of an interesting demographic was a kind of shift in that demographic we're seeing. But additionally, I think, you know, as going back to the expensive land sort of diminishing on the waterfront, you're starting to see 
second and third tier sites, which are with a much lower cost come into play. So four years or five years, six years ago, when we were selling Brickell Avenue or Biscayne Boulevard or what have you, or waterfront property, that the, the land price, just the very nature of the land price, drove the condominium price to a very high number. Whereas up, if we're now in West Brickell, like Smart Brickell or you know, in Wynwood or in Edgewater, off the water, in, in, in markets like that, um, you're looking at the land price that does directly impact the cost of the, of the unit. So you're seeing architects design smaller units, not necessarily micro units, although that is a definite trend coming into the market, uh, but we're seeing more efficient units, we're seeing finished units, because um, a lot of these millennials in that demographic uh, want a turnkey solution. They don't want to come in and design it and have that hassle. They want to be able to walk in, it's fit, finished, done. Um, use of the technology, that is something I think is going to be very much attracting the millennial buyer. Um, but that land value is impacting the price dramatically. And I think we're starting to get to a point now where uh, with product like that, we start to see that, that attraction. And frankly, the millennials are getting to an age where they will start getting married and having kids, and that will spike home sales. I would say that, that the millennia are uh, very opportunity. Uh, it's, it's a very nice opportunity for everybody because it's a, it's a bunch of people that has certain uh, 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 for the way of or thinking. For example, they are excellent tenants. I mean, they, as you as said, if, if, if we create a smaller unit, efficiency unit, the millennia goes for like micro unit or a smaller unit than a big, bigger unit. So you, you could rent more per square foot because it's a small size of the unit and the millennia like that. The millennia like the efficiency. Um, so I think they are great tenants. Uh, in addition, there is a new generation coming, which is the Centennial, for example. The Centennial are totally different than the Millennial. The Centennial are younger, younger people than Millennial, but they saw the Millennial like the Millennial do not like the car, do not like the boat, do not like the, the house, but the Centennial are more capitalistic. Capitalistic people, uh, young people, say no. I want a house. I want. A, I want a very nice car. So there is a new generation coming that um, is going to replace the the millennial uh, or strategy or way of living. Anyone would like to add more to that, Toby? Yeah, I'm seeing in in my office, um, which is positive, is clients are coming in and they're corporations and companies moving to Florida. And I think one of the biggest weaknesses that we've had is that we don't really have, so I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, like I told you, so we have Honeywell, IBM, 3M, Market Daniels, Midland, and all these companies, like Pillsbury, I can just go on and on. Here in Miami or South Florida, we are now starting to get corporations coming in. We have uh, a number of companies in the past 24 months that have come in that are wishing to relocate. Obviously some of them are major and everybody is reading about it, like Amazon, but <clears throat> we're an architectural company. We have about 70 people in the office, so we're a small business. But those kind of companies are continuously, I see them moving to Florida, and that has a major impact. And again, it, and when I asked them, why are you considering Florida? Um, they said, we looked at Florida before, and we didn't have the brain power, but now we're seeing the brain power being here, the international. Um, and they're seeing Florida as a positive besides the quality of life. So they're seeing that the labor force is available here. So I don't I mean, that's positive to hear. I think to your earlier point about the the, uh, the sun and the sand <coughs> in South Florida, I think most employers understand that they don't have to pay people that much in Miami because um, people are going to move here anyway or they're not going to leave. Um, whereas that might not be true in other markets. You can start having trouble and difficulty retaining talent or attracting talent, you have to pay people more. And Miami employers just kind of say, well, yeah, we got you. you know, you're, you're not leaving or we're going to move here anyway. So on the income side, we have extremely you know, low or relative uh, incomes. And on the, on the, on the uh, expense side, you know, the, the, as was mentioned before, you know, it's really the housing costs plus transportation costs. And 
in Dade County, we've actually invested in public transportation over the last 30 years. We moved Metro Rail, Metro Mover, Tri Rail, Metro Rail extension to the airport. Bay Link has come and gone as a you know proposition a couple of times. We have uh, Miami Central and Old Port Florida, Brightline under construction. So we've actually made passenger rail investments. The problem is that the, the, the great tragedy is we build our housing as far away as possible from our public transportation. And I'm not talking about like high-rise condos. I'm talking about like housing for normal people. Um, like, <laughs> it's just, you know, West Kendall and Doral and, and you know, but even, even some of the condo areas like Aventura, you know, Sunny Isles, and there's no public, you know, they're not near a metro rail stop or anything like that. So that's, that's a big problem. We, we built our, our housing as far away from uh, public transportation as possible. And the other thing is we haven't built enough housing. We haven't built anywhere near enough housing. And the problem isn't for developers by the time. The problem, the real problem is, is zoning. Local governments not understanding the kind of housing density that you need to achieve and you can achieve in highly compatible contextual building typologies. I'm developing an eight unit apartment building on a 5,000 square foot lot in Little Havana. The, that, that effective density is 70 units to the acre. But what is most of Little Havana zone? 36 units to the acre, half of that. So, uh, and that's a three-story apartment building. So if you just floated that density up to what it should be from 36 units to the acre to 72 units to the acre, there's about 1,000 acres of the city that's in that three-story zoning category. You just created 36,000 new housing units. And you didn't build a single additional square foot of building. Like, just keep the building envelope as it is in that zoning, in, in T4 zoning. And it didn't cost you a dime. There's no tax credits, there's no, but what does 36,000 new housing units in one city, in one zoning category, do to regional housing affordability? <coughs> now repeat that thought experiment. All the first ring neighborhoods, second ring neighborhoods, and, 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 and first ring cities in Dade County, and why, you know, we, we got in this housing affordability problem because we didn't build enough housing units and we didn't build enough housing units because the zoning is wrong. So if we, if we want to address regional housing affordability, we have to look at fixing the densities in our first and second ring urban neighborhoods close to transit and, uh, and getting them right. Um, and I'm not talking about more height or more FAR. Talking about the existing buildings that we're already comfortable with, filling them with units that people can, can afford. Great. Thank you. Now, before opening it to the voting, now that I think everyone in this session is absolutely clear that we all are going to start writing Uber, that Russell, we live on heaven down here in Miami. We're going to move <coughs> from Canada to live in Miami Central. We have the train station downstairs. And all our groceries are going to be delivered to our home with a push on a button. What question would you like to ask this family? Not a quick question on that one. When you say on density, um, my, concern, my concern on the density is what's going to happen with water and sewer. And because you, you, have, you know, have density of Ravana, <laughs> then you have a problem. Let's say that we don't need cars, like Alfonso was saying. What happened with water, sewer, electricity, and everything at this time? Well, uh, the, the, the more dense that you build, the more efficiently you, use, you utilize it. <coughs> so building a brand new water and sewer loop at the edge of the Everglades in West Doral, West Kendall, is the least efficient way to use water and sewer infrastructure. The most efficient way to use that water and sewer infrastructure is to upgrade it in an urban area that's going to serve many apartment buildings lining the street. So it's actually a net benefit from a fiscal standpoint to the region to, to densify and use the infrastructure that we already have or should upgrade more efficiently. Anyone else? Thank you. One of the recurring themes that I keep hearing different panels talk about is the transportation issue. 
Um, if you're building in Brickell, downtown, all that, that's great. There's Metro Mover and all that. But for example, the people that do live in Kendall that need to go pick up their kids after school, so they can't just necessarily depend on you know the Uber lifestyle. And either way, they're leaving Kendall at 8:30 in the morning to work. Say, forget about downtown. The Gables, they're still spending 45 minutes peak time. It becomes expensive. Do you guys have any solutions or ideas for improving the transportation issue that takes everything west of the Gable becomes a problem for a lot of people to get into a work? Thank you. I can jump on that with just a quick note because I think transportation besides being planned, and I do agree with Mr. Price said about intensification of density within an urban core is a more cost efficient way to use infrastructure. But or, the transportation also is organic, so there's a community in Miami <clears throat> that arrived here about 20, 30 years ago, and services mostly hospitality, and, and it became a strong community and very hardworking community. And they have their own transportation system. It's the Haitian community that have the jitneys. And if I can find a way how I can get on the jitney or get them on my on my iPhone, I would jump in. Another system just that's organic is in downtown Miami. We started the trolley again. And it might not be efficient right now, but I can tell you, I was in Brickell and I want to get back to 29th and Biscayne, and it was right there. I jumped on it, it was faster than any Uber I would have taken. So transportation is also what you will see now with the technology, ride sharing, carpool, will become very prominent because like the gentleman said, not everybody wants to or can't afford an Uber, right? <coughs> Uber is, is more efficient, but it's not the only solution, and there is no savior, so you can't just say Lyft and Uber is a savior. But there is ride sharing and so forth, which is very efficient and can help you as long as the technology is there. And today, luckily, we have the technology catching up. Options. I think. I think another thing. Another question. Yeah, another thing to think about is, is if, you know, not everyone in, in West Kendall, uh, not everyone's going to be able to commute. So I think bringing more commercial uses or mixing of uses. So if you have this, this whole fabric of West Kendall that's built where the uses are very segregated. Yeah. The housing is over here, and the retail is over there, and the jobs are over there. Um, and so can, can, we, can we change the zoning to incrementally bring more of these uses together so I don't have to go quite so far to get the things that I need to do. I'm, I'm clearly not gonna maybe not hop on a train and get downtown to shop at Whole Foods, but can we bring maybe my job a little bit closer? Can we? Can we get comfortable as a community in mixing our mixing our uses for the convenience that that generates? When we've gotten really comfortable for many decades, <laughs> saying I don't really I want to segregate. If that's kind of the goal of the original goal of, of zoning is to just keep things apart. So can we can we mix the uses and layer on the top of that transportation options? Yeah, because just to be specific to what Andrew said is that. You can look at Datron and Dentland. We're working on the Datron Center now and recycling that in high wards from hospitality, office, residential, mixed use, retail, and commercial. And it is on the link to get you where you want to go in the public transportation. Doral. Doral is a perfectly good example. That's a brand new urban core on the west side of the airport that was built. It has its own town center and core. And that's really the direction we're going. You have a historical look at this building. This building was designed 100 years ago, and you can just think what people were thinking 100 years ago and how it relates to where the future is. And we are just recycling what people have thought about before this urban planning. That's all we're doing. But the day train is a good example. In all the periphery areas, we're not going to throw away the infrastructure. We're going to recycle it, increase the density and intensification, and, and recycle the, the infrastructure that we have. And a follow on that thought, uh, you know, we also sell single family homes, so we actually sell to normal people as well, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, it's what I love about Miami is we're very impatient, right? Because we want to be a great big city and then we want all the infrastructure and everything to be done overnight. Uh, but we, it's, it's, it's a city in, in, in progress. So, you know, to go back to the earlier questions of the impact of some of this prime land being picked off and limited availability. It is really creating neighborhoods in Miami. And even as, as few years ago as 15 years, we didn't have very defined neighborhoods. Now we you know, we know, uh, you know Sandy just mentioned West Brickell. I never was a West Brickell, it was Brickell. Right. Or downtown, it was, but now we've got downtown, then you've got Brickell side, then you've got West Brickell, you've got Edgewood, you've got Wynwood, you've got Durant, you've got all these neighborhoods that have been created. 
And as those neighborhoods create, going back to the zoning conversation, and, and the businesses that are coming in, and it's not only in Miami and Broward and West Palm as you go north, um, you'll see these neighborhoods come in and this influx of businesses are starting to create uh, economic centers in those neighborhoods. And then not to put too fine a point on it, but we all know how everyone drives in South Florida, and it drives me absolutely crazy, you know, when there's a five cars between me and the next car, and I'm on US-1 trying to get from South to North, and that's when you realize the importance of self-driving cars that will all talk to each other and, and create a lot more efficiency on our roadway system. We don't have that luxury of expanding our roadways. We're just, we're, we're not just simply for the cool factor, it's a necessity for us moving forward. And I think that's gonna alleviate significantly those outlying suburbs um, in the next 10 years. Just kind of waiting. Yes. It's a from San Pedro. And I have two kids, 10 and 9. Uh, one is the big problem is schools. I know that we are developing, developing a lot of units, and uh, there's no school. So I have to take my kids far away. Right now, I have to drive farther to take my two kids. Because the school that is in Brickell is in fifth grade. That's what it is. So my kids are going up to another grade, and I have to go far away to take my kids. Uh, my question is, why the other developers don't try to build a big school, buy a land together, and put a big school or brick on? Because when my international buyers tell me, all right, okay, all right, stay, I want to buy these units. Oh, where's the near school? You're like, oh, well, you know, you, this one is in the fifth grade. No, no, my kid is 11, 12. Where I have to take those kids? Uh, to private. No, no, I don't want to pay private. So why, in all this year, I've been nine years in, in this country, and uh, you know, I'm living in Brickell, and uh, no schools. And you talk to the developers, and, uh, and they say, no, talk to the Miami uh, government, and all, those, all the money that you pay, and uh, they're doing nothing. And in the near future, we'll see that's going to happen. So my kids, we have to go to Yeah, we're looking at our projects that have the schools within it and the transportation to it. If again, it's going to be like a pool of Uber. And this gentleman right here had a question. Yeah. But but there is there's there's impact fee money that's available, and I think developers I think if developers are hearing it from buyers, that they have, there's it's there's no there's no reason that developers can't engage with Dade County Public Schools to put impact fee to work in a new construction. Of course, there's something. nothing stopping that. It's just in a yeah, it's, it's another industry, another business, the, the school, because it involves governments and operation agreements, etc. Uh, but for example, in Smart Grid, we're thinking about that. Um, we have a, a, a water to kids, for kids. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, they, care, they care for, the, for kids, thinking in the needs that the potential buyers or tenant would have. For the kids, so we thinking in that. It's, it, we are thinking in that, for example. And we let it going to West Rico as well. I think, and uh, yeah, Al Milo's uh, development is something. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to, to cut, we have to go to the break and to lunch. I think we would be the whole day here talking about the future of Miami. Yeah. Just, all right. Yeah, thank you for listening.